September 11th, Ancient Israel, and Nine Omens. Author Jonathan Kahn reveals the supernatural secret to America's future on today's 700 Club. Good evening and welcome to this special edition of the 700 Club. I'm Lee Webb. Pat Robertson and Terry Mewson will be along shortly. But first, the 2012 race for the White House kicked off today with the Republican presidential caucus in the state of Iowa. The race tonight is still too close to call, but we can tell you that it's been a big night for former Pennsylvania Republican Senator Rick Santorum, finishing in a virtual dead heat with Mitt Romney. With most of the vote recorded tonight, Romney leads with about 25 percent. Santorum has about 25 percent. In fact, we understand that last count, uh, Santorum was about 40 votes ahead. Ron Paul rounds out the top three with about 21 percent. They're followed by Newt Gingrich in fourth, Rick Perry and Michelle Bachman in sixth. Now here with the latest from Iowa is our political reporter David Brody. We had hoped to have him by Skype, but we understand we have him by phone tonight. David, uh, first of all, tell us what the mood is like at Rick Santorum's headquarters. Uh, one word tonight, Lee, and the word is jubilant. Uh, they are expecting some sort of one-two finish here. They're not quite sure exactly what's going to happen ultimately, but uh, there are chance of Rick Santorum and uh, we pick Rick. And there's quite a bit of festive, um, uh, festive mood in the air, if you will. Look, this is a remarkable story, Lee. It really is. I mean, this is a guy who pretty much was non-existent in the polls until about a month ago. And then all of a sudden, boom, he caught fire. He became, as we've come to know, the flavor of the month. And what a month he picked to become the flavor. Uh, this, this, what has happened has been pretty remarkable. Why? Strong debate performances an authentic conservative message that has resonated. And quite frankly, Lee, other candidates have stumbled. Gingrich has stumbled. Uh, Rick Perry with the oops moment has stumbled. Michelle Bachman, a lot of folks didn't necessarily see her as a president when they looked at her. And then there's Rick Santorum, who has a very nice, stellar resume, two-time U.S. senator in GOP leadership, and he had no flaws along the way, Lee. Well, David, it is a remarkable story, and stay with us because uh, we want to go back to you and get more on, on what's going on at Rick Santorum's headquarters. I do want to bring in uh, our senior political analyst, uh, John Waggy, who's with me here on the set. John, how did he do it? A, a lot of folks are going to say he came out of nowhere, but I would think Rick Santorum would say he worked very hard for this. He went to every county in the state of Iowa. He did, and he did it first, and he spent his time there, and he bided his time. That was the other thing. While all these candidates were rising to the top, one by one, Michelle Bachman, as David mentioned, Herman Cain, Newt Gingrich, they all took their turn. But when you came to the last week of the campaign, there was Rick Santorum left, solid conservative, uncompromising in his principles, uh, at home and comfortable with evangelical voters as well as economic conservatives and a good decent family man and and voters just kind of gravitated toward him at the end and he he, he really had the benefit of good timing we understand uh, that we have video of uh, Ron Paul at his headquarters tonight in Iowa is he speaking right now let's take a look at what's going on at Ron Paul headquarters as we mentioned, he had 21 percent of the vote, and he is speaking. Let's, uh, let's take a listen to what he's saying. Before I continue with any more comments, I do want to bring uh, at least step forward uh, three, three of our chairmen. Uh, you met already, A.J. Stryker and, uh, and, and, and David Fisher would step forward, as well as Drew Ivers, who's been the chairman. And they are on the Central Committee, and they have led the charge all throughout Iowa. But, uh, John, let's talk about Ron Paul. 21 percent. Is this a good night for him? Well, it is a good night for him. And the question is, what's he going to do next week in New Hampshire? What's he going to do in the states beyond that? Now, four years ago, he did pretty well with the fundraising, and he has a, a dedicated uh, cadre of young supporters who come out and work for him. But he spent a lot of time in Iowa as well, and the question is whether he can carry this to a national campaign. He is not going to be the Republican nominee for president. That we pretty much know. The question is, how long is he going to stay in the race? Are fellow Republicans going to give him 
respect and uh, welcome him as part of the Republican fold, or are they going to try and marginalize him? And I think we're going to see a couple more debates coming up, and there'll be a big foreign policy debate, I think, between Rick Santorum and Ron Paul, uh, because they have a huge gap between the two of them uh, uh, in concerning Iran, Israel, the Middle East, and issues of uh, America's role internationally. David, in your opinion, what will Rick Santorum have to do to translate this success in Iowa tonight to a win or at least a, a reasonable showing in New Hampshire? Well, he's going to have to do a couple things. Uh, first of all, he's going to have to define this race right now. In other words, it's, he, the, probably the best thing for him to do is to go around the country now and say, I am the authentic conservative candidate and hit Mitt Romney as the inauthentic conservative candidate. If he can get that narrative to take form, to take hold, uh, that's going to play very well for him. The other thing he needs to do is convince people of his electability. We've seen some of this already. He talks about how he has won in a, in a blue state, if you will, of Pennsylvania. Uh, and so he says he's won tough elections, and he has, but right now Mitt Romney has the edge in terms of electability. Santorum is going to have to prove that. I also think, and you know, John Waggy made a great point as it relates to foreign policy. Uh, when Rick Santorum and Ron Paul square off on foreign policy, that's a good situation for Rick Santorum to coalesce more national security conservatives to his side because it's going to show a, a, a very much a contrast difference between the two. Finally, Lee, I would just say this. Look, uh, Rick Santorum's banner everywhere he goes, it says this, faith, excuse me, faith, family, and freedom. Mm -hmm. And those are the three key things that he has talked about on the campaign trail, and he's woven in a message of American exceptionalism everywhere he's gone. It's very important. Well, uh, voters in New Hampshire, of course, uh, we've been told, care less about uh, uh, the social issues in New Hampshire than they do about the economy. And earlier today, Mitt Romney hammered President Obama on the issue of the economy. Let's take a listen. He went on the Today Show shortly after being inaugurated and said that if he's not able to turn around the economy in three years, he'd be looking at a one-term proposition. I'm here to collect. He's out. John Waggy, the economy, jobs, that, that's, those are still the issues that will resonate throughout the rest of this campaign, right? It's truly, but they also resonated in Iowa. Unemployment was the number one issue in Iowa, even though it's a fairly low unemployment state. So I don't think you're going to have that big a shift going into New Hampshire. The bigger shift is that instead of a caucus, you're going to have a primary. And uh, voters from uh, independent voters and, and those kind of people can participate in the primary, even as they could in the caucus, but you don't have to show up for three hours on a cold night like they did in Iowa. You just come to the right. voting, voting booth and vote. But but one thing I'd like to do is put in a little bit of perspective. Okay. The winner of the Republican nomination, eventual winner, has to have 1,145 delegates. They chose 28 tonight in Iowa. That's how big Iowa is. 28 votes out of 1,145, yeah. and they're going to be proportionally divided. New Hampshire is going to choose 12 because they were punished for holding their primary in January. So we're not talking about a big percentage that's yeah. been voted on yet. We have a long way to go. Long way to go. John, let me ask you, you know, we've had these rising and fading stars so far within the Republican race. You had Michelle Bachman, you had Rick Perry, you had Herman Cain, the latest Newt Gingrich, and they all seem to rise and fall. Does that indicate to you that the Republicans, Republican voters in this country are not satisfied with any of these candidates? Well, I don't think they're satisfied. I think they're frustrated more than anything else. You've got a 24-7 media environment where every mistake is hammered away with, pounded at, and you really have a hard time keeping an even keel in something like that. And of course, Romney's held up fairly well through the months, but, but these other candidates have, have really, uh, some have stumbled of their own accord, others have been attacked, Gingrich, huge media buy by the Romney people to attack Gingrich. And I think there's more frustration on the part of the Republican base than anything else right. that, doggone it, this should be about Obama, not about our candidates, because right. they should be able to beat Obama, and it's not. And I think there's frustration as a result of that. David, I know it's early, but uh, do you still think that this is Mitt Romney's race to lose? Oh, yeah. I don't think there's any question about it. When you say this race, if you're talking about the actual nomination itself, yes. yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me just say this. The, the latest numbers coming in here, uh, we're looking at it. 125 votes separate 
Rick Santorum and Mitt Romney, with Mitt Romney having that slight uh, lead. So it, it'll be interesting to see. Look, I just want to say one other thing here as it relates to New Hampshire. Let's remember, after Mitt Romney, who's made the most appearances, well, uh, save John Huntsman, and John Huntsman has pretty much uh, camped out in New Hampshire forever. But beyond Huntsman and Romney, Rick Santorum is the guy that spent the most time there after those two guys. So, I mean, Rick Santorum is going to go to New Hampshire uh, with, a, with some momentum clearly from this, but he's also spent a lot of time there. He's got some organization there. Uh, and don't forget, uh, he did well tonight with the Tea Party and evangelicals here in Iowa. And guess what? In South Carolina, there's even a bigger evangelical and even yeah. bigger Tea Party uh, contingent down there. So, uh, you know, we, we've, got a, we've got a barn burner here for a little while. And then, and then Florida as well. David, thank you for your reporting from uh, Rick Santorum's headquarters in, uh, in Iowa tonight. We appreciate your reporting. We know you'll be in New Hampshire to cover that race for us a week from tonight. And, uh, John, uh, thank you for your insight as well. We appreciate sure. it. Uh, turning to other news tonight, Egyptians returned to the polls today for a third round of voting for members of a new parliament in that country. The Muslim Brotherhood is expected to consolidate earlier gains. Moments before the polling began there, the Brotherhood announced it will not recognize the state of Israel. Gary Lane has more. The Muslim Brotherhood has yet to be seated in a new parliament, and already it's giving the world a hint at how it may govern. Like Israel's enemy in Gaza, Hamas, the Brotherhood says it will never recognize Israel's right to exist. The deputy chairman of the Muslim Brotherhood, Rashad Bayoumi, reportedly said Sunday, that his organization will not recognize Israel under any circumstances. He called Israel an occupying criminal entity. Bayoumi also said the Brotherhood will take legal steps to cancel the 1979 peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. Bayoumi's announcement came just two days before Egyptians began a third round of voting to elect members of a new parliament. The Muslim Brotherhood won about 36 percent of the vote in the first two rounds of voting. The extreme Islamist al Nur party received about 29 percent. This Egyptian says he won't be voting for secularists. Why don't we try Islamists? We have tried seculars, liberals and communists before, and they ruined the country. So we should try Islamists this time. And if it doesn't work well, it's not a problem. We can change them. But Middle East analyst Walid Farah says once the Muslim Brotherhood establishes control of a new government, Egyptians may find it difficult to reverse course. Their plan is basically to move into government, into those ministries, into bureaucracies, and eventually into the armed forces and uh, seize power as much as they can. The Muslim Brotherhood's aim, final goal, is to establish an Islamic state uh, like Iran or like Sudan or ultimately like the Taliban. Up next, the struggle over who will draft the new constitution. The Muslim Brotherhood wants the new parliament to appoint the people assigned to write the document. The ruling military council says it will decide. It wants the new constitution to be written by non-Islamists as well, including Christians. Gary Lane, CBN News. The head of Iran's army warns the United States not to send any more aircraft carriers into the Persian Gulf. The USS John C. Stennis, uh, Stennis left the Gulf and passed through the Strait of Hormuz last week. That general statement came today as Iran ended a 10-day military exercise at the entrance to the Persian Gulf. Iran test-fired three missiles designed to sink warships. But the U.S. isn't backing down. A Pentagon spokesman says deployment of U.S. military assets in the Persian Gulf region will continue as it has for decades. Stocks rose sharply on the first trading day of the year. Manufacturing in America expanded last month at the fastest pace in six months. Construction spending also jumped in November. Investors seemed encouraged by the positive news. The Dow closing about 180 points higher today. The Nasdaq was up about 44 points. And the S&P was up nearly 20 points. Economists around the world are focused on two key issues as 2012 begins, the debt crisis in Europe and the massive federal deficits here in the U.S. Paul Strand examines the impact of those two problems on the economy this year. Most of 2011 was spent worrying whether the economy would plunge over another cliff. 2012 could just ratchet up the pressure, or not. To get an informed view of where the economy may be headed this year, we came here to Dobbs Ferry, New York, along the Hudson River. This is where Mark Skousen, one of the country's leading economic forecasters, lives and does his forecasting. 
This editor of the influential Forecasts and Strategies newsletter worries Europe's debt crisis will take down the EU and could seriously hurt the U.S. as well. What you're facing is the possibility of an unraveling of the Eurozone. Bill Beach, a top economic analyst at the Heritage Foundation, says if countries like heavily in debt Italy default on their debts, it will likely kill many major banks in Europe which could topple American giants. As major financial institutions from Bank of America to Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, all of these that are now banking operations begin to see their investments in, these, in those European banks uh, extinguished. How bad could it get? It's a major recession, it's riots in the streets, it's a collapsing stock market, a stock market crash, all of the scenarios that your worst uh, nightmare uh, is what people are in fear of. Beach is casting a wary eye on a whole other region that could create problems for America, the oil-rich Middle East. Anything that disturbs the Middle East affects the oil price, which affects, of course, our economy. He points out the Arab Spring may be producing more radically Islamic governments. The governments that are coming in are not coming in as progressive governments that have a favorable view to Israel. So that raises the concern that if Iran and Israel get into a military confrontation over Iran's possible nuclear weapons, other Islamic powers could also go after Israel and turn this into a region-wide war that could threaten the oil supplies and cripple the economies of both Europe and the U.S. Still, the U.S. doesn't have to look outside its borders to find another source of problems. Both Skousen and Beach worry if Washington politicians can't agree to tackle the huge annual federal deficits and $15 trillion federal debt, America's credit rating will fall and shaky times grow shakier. Congress was supposed to come up with a solution, and they didn't come up with a solution. All of the financial credit rating agencies are very concerned about it. Skousen, though, isn't all gloom and doom. He's hoping the Federal Reserve may soon raise interest rates after keeping them so low for so long. Skousen says that would be a sign that economic growth is coming back. If they raise interest rates, that will, tell, that will send a message out to all the world that we're back to normal, we're moving back to normal. And Beach sees many positive trends for at least one sector of America's economy. I think 2012 will see the United States hold and grow its dominance in the high technology area. We're seeing a lot of entrepreneurial activity, new firms, new startups. Skousen says corporations have been making record profits, but have been frozen with fear that investing, building, expanding, and hiring may not be the smart thing to do, because if the Democrats win Congress and Obama the White House in 2012, and... If uh, Obama remains a uh, ideologue, then uh, it could be another four frustrating years. Many seem to have their fingers crossed more business-friendly politicians will win in November, wiping out liberal initiatives. I think there's a real possibility that uh, if the Republicans gain control of Congress and the presidency, that a lot of this will, will be reversed and that businesses will just load up and start uh, investing and hiring people and so forth. But remember, whether President Obama is elected or Governor Romney or Speaker Gingrich or whoever, the main problem remains right in front of us, and that is the fiscal mess of the United States government. So where will the American economy flow in coming days? Could be up, could be down, much may depend on Europe, and whether American politicians continue to hamper or help American businesses. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Dobbs Ferry, New York. Thank you, Paul. And before we go back to uh, Pat Robertson to get his insights into the economic outlook for 2012, we want to bring you the latest from Iowa tonight. It looks like the Iowa caucus is going to go down to the wire with uh, Mitt Romney and uh, Rick Santorum uh, virtually in a dead heat at 25 percent of the votes. Uh, we understand that, uh, uh, that Mitt Romney has about a 400-point lead with uh, Gingrich coming in at 13. Stay tuned. We'll have more of the 700 Club after this. Like a great success story. I dropped 30 pounds and as many inches. Well, we've got millions of them. So far, I have lost 70 pounds. In my first month, I lost 20 pounds. I have lost uh, 100 pounds and 80 inches. And your success story could be next. Curves work. I've seen it work in millions of women around the world. It keeps you just motivated to take the next level. This is the first time I've been able to lose this much weight and actually keep it off. Right now you can get started on your success story for just $10. Millions of women have reached their goals at Curves thanks to our fun, fast, total body workout and great coaches who are always here to teach and motivate you. So, 
Are you ready to see what success looks like on you? I'm in the best shape I have ever been in my life. It works. It, it really works. Come get started on your success story for just $10, only at Curves. Tomorrow on the 700 Club, let the skinny chick show you the foods that are making you fat. And they're not the ones you think. Plus, I didn't feel like the flu. It was so bizarre to me. A mysterious illness. She was in pain and it was not normal. A desperate teen and a supernatural diagnosis. I had never heard of the Seven Heart Club. Never watched it. Tomorrow. Well, every year, every New Year, CBN and Regent University come together for a time of praise, worship, and we pray together. And then Pat also shares what the Lord has shown him about the year ahead. So let's take a look at part of his message from yesterday's prayer meeting. The Lord said, and I'm quoting, Your country will be torn apart by internal stress. A house divided cannot stand. There must be an urgent call to prayer. And I think that's one of the things CBN has got to do this year, is just urge people to pray. What God says at the beginning of this is loose the bonds of wickedness. I don't know what we've got to do to get people free, but there are people in bondage, people in slavery, people in, in all kinds of situations. Just imagine. But basically, God says, how can you be content? How can you be content when there are millions of people going to hell around the world? And God's heart reaches out to these people. He, his heart is moved with compassion uh, for these who are his creatures. And that's our job. God's got it under control. That's the good news. God's got it under control. Of course, we know that, that God does have it under control, but yes. yet he calls us to pray. He sure does. I mean, then in Second Chronicles, I mean, that's very clear that the onus is on his people. That's right. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about, about where you see things going, what God's right. spoken uh, to you. I uh, spent the better part of a week in prayer and just saying, God, show me something. And I'll share with you uh, some things I'll share with you. I think he showed me about uh, the next president, but I'm not supposed to talk about that, so I'll leave you in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> probably just as well. Probably just as well, <laughs> but I think I know who it's going to be. All right. I'm going to read just what I wrote down, and I'm as if I'm hearing from the Lord these words. Your country will be torn apart by internal stress. A house divided cannot stand. Your president holds a radical view of the direction of your country, which is at odds with the majority. Expect chaos and paralysis. Your president holds a view which is at the odds with the majority. It's a radical view of the future of the country, and so that's why we're having this division. This is a spiritual battle which can only be won by overwhelming prayer. The future of the world is at stake because if America falls, there's no longer a strong champion of freedom and a champion of the oppressed of the world. There must be an urgent call to prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, the Lord said, a time of maximum stress and peril greater than at any time since the CBN ministry began. This country will begin disintegrating. Now, I thought, when did we start this place? I started uh, CBN in, in, I think, 1960. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, uh, uh, you think of all the things that went on. You have the assassination of the president, the assassination of Martin Luther King. You've got a war in Vietnam. You've got all these things. He said it's a worse stress than before. So I'm saying, God, uh, let me give you some, some, some suggestions, and you tell me if any of them is right. You know, <laughs> pick one. So I said, is it an EMP blast? No, that isn't it. Uh, is it a cosmic or solar radiation blast? No. Uh, is it the Mayan galaxy alignment? No, it's not that. Which will shock many. <laughs> is it Iranian or North Korean nuclear threat? No. Is it an earthquake or a volcano? No. Is it a massive power failure? No. What is it? It's an economic collapse. And God said, and I quote, this is not my judgment. They are bringing it upon themselves. Yeah. It's almost like we're in a, a morass that we can't, can't well, extricate ourselves it's, from. It's, it's incredible. 
you know. Uh, but here the economy is it's like a boat going over a waterfall, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, people are rowing against each other. One group is rowing to try to keep from going over the fall. The other is saying, well, let's just take it easy and let the thing keep, yeah. keep flowing. And <clears throat> so in any event, that's um, the other. Let's see. There's so many things that the Lord showed me, uh, but uh, uh, let me see here. Uh, the next president, he, he, the Lord said, is going to be like a pilot in an airplane who takes the controls as the, as the plane is going into a steep dive and grabs control to try to bring the thing away from a crash. We're heading for a crash, a financial crash of major proportions. And the next president is going to be like them to grab the controls and, you know, do all the things he's... The thing back but up, it's yeah. tough to do yes, because the, the machine doesn't want to right itself. It's too... It's, it, the, the momentum is so bad. All right. Now, the next thing, CBN will have the best year ever. We'll have an amazing harvest of souls. Now, we, we counted yesterday in the prayer meeting, 620 million people have recorded somewhere or other recorded or have been uh, marked as, as, as accepting the Lord. A greater harvest than ever. This, this year is going to be fantastic. And uh, it'll be in the United States and overseas, what we're going to see. And uh, so, uh, let's see. Then the, the Lord showed me something that I think is very, very important. I, he, I read carefully about Galatians. And the Apostle Paul is talking about the works of the flesh. The Greek word is sarx, the flesh. And uh, he, he listed the works of the flesh. And you see some of the things in there. Of course, you've got immorality and sensuality, which we see so much of. But you've got enmities, strife, jealousy, dissensions, factions. All this is the party spirit. We're seeing it in, in, in more graphic detail than ever before in our history. And God says very clearly, and I want to read it, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's, that's not a word from here. That's a word from him. <laughs> it's a word from him. And it's in you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't tell me about your party spirit. It's, 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 it's sinful. Now he says the fruit of the spirit, listen to this, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Last on self-control. That's one of the problems in our country. We don't have self-control. We don't have control over our spending. We don't have control over our eating. We don't have control over our drinking. We don't have control over our sensuality. Yes. There's no self control And th there's not a government big enough. So the liberals want to put in more and more and more and more controls to do what only God himself can yes. do. Yeah. Because there is no, there's nothing in, once we've given that part of ourselves away, there's nothing to make us want to take it back. That's I mean, right. it's, we really need the Spirit of God to do a move and, and in our land. And then when and somebody in our tries to warn about it, uh, what they, they're then condemned. Yes. All right. So that says those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with the uh, passions and desires. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm just telling you right now that great things are going to happen in the spiritual world. It's going to be good. But I also tell you that the country that we live in that we love so much is entering a period of maximum stress. And it's there because of conflicting points of view about what is the way to save the nation and this mounting debt. And we're out of control. We don't have self-control as citizens. And we want more and more and more from the government. And we're not willing to trust in God. So we're going to pay the price. And again, God says, this isn't my judgment. This is yours. You're bringing it on yourself. And yet in the midst of that, we will see the Spirit of God move. You Amen. know, after our New Year's prayer meeting, we walked over to the grounds of Regent University. We're all kind of connected here to dedicate a new chapel being built there that's going to have tremendous implications. Let's take a look. We dedicate this place to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We have over here uh, a scroll. So I want to sign this. All right, and if my dear wife would come, this is going to be a gorgeous chapel, and it's going to be a classroom building for the School of Divinity, which is now one of the largest divinity schools in the country. This 
little scroll will go into this cornerstone. It'll be sealed in concrete. Father, in Jesus' name, you're the only cornerstone. You lay in Zion a precious cornerstone. Let this be the cornerstone of your planting. Use this building, this chapel, these classrooms for your glory always. We dedicate them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. A new chapel here on our campus. That's going to mean a new building for the Divinity School. We have a wonderful yeah. Divinity School here. We do, and we have close to a thousand students and more. And and there's a great demand right now. We we don't have enough classroom space. We're jammed yeah. up with, uh, and so this is it's going to be an amazing presence on the campus. It'll here. be lovely. It's a mm -hmm. gorgeous building, and I just think it'll be a center of prayer. The students want something to pray. So, yes, in the midst of problems we're building. Yes. So it says exactly. something. The promise right. of God. Well, still ahead, a compelling look into America's future through an ancient message from Israel's past. Author Jonathan Kahn reveals nine secret omens on today's 700 Club. Hello? Hey, handsome. The McCann Twins for Consumer Cellular. Where are you? On the street. I got a new cell phone from Consumer Cellular. They're all the same. Not true. They're complicated, but expensive. I... Long-term contracts, cancellation fees. My plan is just $10 a month. $10 a month? I didn't have to sign a contract. I... There are no cancellation fees. Yeah, but... And I even got a free phone. And when were you going to tell me about this? Call or go to ConsumerCellularTV.com now for no contract plan starting at $10 a month, a free phone, and a 30-day risk-free money-back guarantee. Shipping is free. Let's call and get your free phone. Consumer Cellular is the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members who get special benefits and discounts. My first call. Hello? Hey, ugly. <laughs> call 1-800-368-6425 or log on to ConsumerCellularTV.com. Something inside of me just told me I need to get checked out. The doctor said we found something and we need to get into surgery. Beth Gomez had stage three colon cancer. That's when we scheduled an appointment for a second opinion at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. To find out more about treatment options for complex and late stage cancer, go to cancercenter.com. You'll be able to see our treatment results for many types of cancers and how they compare to national averages. You can also check for participating insurance plans. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, every resource, every one of us, everything we do every day is focused on you, our patient, your treatment, your healing, your survival. You had a whole team. I wasn't just going to fight this battle. They were going to stand beside me and fight it. Our physicians, clinicians, and nurses are highly experienced and dedicated. We use state-of-the-art technology and give you treatment options you may not even know exist. Cancer makes you really appreciate what's important in your life. Please call or go to cancercenter.com today. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. Israeli and Palestinian negotiators are meeting face-to-face -face for the first time in 16 months today. But expectations are low for any progress in the talks being held in Jordan. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says he hopes the United States won't be paralyzed during this year's presidential elections. He says it's unacceptable that Israeli and Palestinian negotiations could be ignored during the election cycle. Palestinians have refused to talk to Israel unless it halts construction in Jewish communities in the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria, otherwise known as the West Bank. That's where the Palestinians want a future Palestinian state. Nigeria is in a state of emergency after a series of deadly attacks by a radical Muslim sect. The emergency declaration by the country's president allows security forces to make arrests without proof and conduct searches without warrants. The president also ordered all international borders near the attack sites be closed. The attackers targeted churches as well as the state offices of Nigeria's secret police. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Falls are the number one cause of injury to senior citizens. Acorn Stairlifts has a solution. Just don't fall. Sit. Relax. Ride with an Acorn Stairlift, the world's leader in stairlifts. 
Don't let limited mobility keep you from going up and down your stairs, even outside. Call Acorn Stair Lifts now for a free information kit and no obligation quote. Why risk falling when you can safely ride? Our Acorn Stair Lift is definitely more affordable than moving. The Acorn Stair Lift has a padded seat and backrest, safety sensors, stop the chair if there are obstacles. The seat swivels and locks so you don't twist your body. And the Acorn Stair Lift folds away. It even works through a power shortage. I was really surprised at how little they cost. Call 1-800-505-3513 for free information. That number again is 1-800-505-3513. 1-800-505-3513. Call now. Over 100,000 people have already had a lifestyle lift. I had my lifestyle lift in 2007, and I'm still loving it. Lifestyle lift, a life-changing procedure with lasting results. I feel great. Can you see this? It's awesome. Lifestyle Lift is America's expert for a younger looking face. Call now to learn how you can receive a free information kit. Want a younger looking face? Call America's expert. I'm 70 and I feel great. Call now. Tomorrow on the 700 Club, let the skinny chick show you the foods that are making you fat. And they're not the ones you think. Plus, I didn't feel like the flu. It was so bizarre to me. A mysterious illness. She was in pain, and it was not normal. A desperate team and a supernatural diagnosis. I had never heard of the Seven Heart Club, never watched it. Tomorrow. Well, we've just turned the corner on a new year. And what does 2012 and the years beyond hold for America's future? Well, according to author Jonathan Kahn, it depends on the ancient mystery from Israel's past. Just watch this. Nine ancient omens, one hidden biblical prophecy, revealed through catastrophic events in America's past and present. It sounds like a plot for a movie, but in his new book, The Harbinger, Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn says it's a sign of the end times. Rabbi Khan combines biblical prophecy with historical events that began in America on 9-11 to keep readers on the edge of their seats. Folks, I was fascinated with this book. It was sent me by the publisher, an advanced copy, Jonathan Kahn. It's called The Harbinger, The Ancient Mystery. And uh, I read it from cover to cover. It's a fascinating book, and it ties the uh, events of 9-11 to the uh, prophecy released uh, by Isaiah in the ninth chapter. And we have the author with us, Jonathan Kahn. He is the uh, rabbi, I believe, of the largest Messianic congregation in America. And uh, Jonathan, I'm glad to have you here. Thank God you. Bless you. It's a blessing to be here. All you. right. Now, the harbinger, a harbinger is like a robin is a harbinger of spring. So mm -hmm. a harbinger is something that kicks off what's coming later. Mm -hmm. You found in Isaiah, what draw you, drew you to Isaiah 9? How, how did it happen? It suddenly it exploded in your mind. Here it is. Well, in, when 9-11 happened, you yeah. know, our ministry is, is nearby um, uh, when it happened. I, I was drawn to Isaiah 9 and 10. I was praying um, that a particular point in Israel's history that was linking up with this. And at the same time, I found out later that David Wilkerson, at the same time, was led that there's a word for America at the same time, and it was the exact same word, exact same verse. Um, and so later on, I was standing at the corner of Ground Zero, and I noticed an object that drew my attention that began the unfolding of a mystery that kept unfolding and getting bigger and bigger and really mind-blowing um, until it got to this which is an, the, the, an ancient mystery that is behind what is happening in America, what has happened in America behind 9-11, behind the economic collapse, behind the, the crash of Wall Street even that has determined the actions and actual words of American leaders. A mystery that goes back two and a half thousand years and is a warning of judgment and a call of God, a prophetic call of now, God. Isaiah 9 was a, a judgment call. It was a rebuke. 
Yes. And uh, you pointed out so clearly the bricks have fallen. Tell us about that. That, that, that was a yeah. rebuke. Yeah. The, the, what happened was, and this is really the first sign, or one of the first signs of a pattern of national judgment, and that is God removes the hedge of protection after calling a nation and calling a nation, right. finally to wake them up. Israel had known God, and Israel had turned away from God. So he called them and called them. Finally, he allowed their hedge of protection to be removed. He allowed a strike to come into the land, an enemy to make a strike. It was temporary, it was limited, and it was to call them back. And then there was a grace period when they kind of hung in the balance. But instead of repenting, instead of turning back to God, they made a vow. And the vow in Isaiah 9, 10 says, The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with quarried stone, hewn stone. The sycamore has been cut down, but we will, we will plant cedars in their place. So they defied God. They said, we're coming back stronger than ever. And so what happened is they set, that seals the course of their, of their nation and of judgment. And ultimately, years later, Israel will be destroyed. Well, you know, I said this, that, that the hedge of protection had been taken down, you know, and people mm -hmm. said, well, wasn't that a horrible thing to say? Well, I said, this is the first time we've been struck since the war of uh, the, you know, 18, 1912. 1912. Yeah. Um, we've never had anything like this. And yet, what do we do? How, how do we respond to 9-11? Well, when 9 yeah, yeah, well, here's the same exact pattern. Now America has known God, and America has, is turning from God. And has, we know that it's turned. And so God is calling. So finally, he allows the same thing, same pattern. He allows the hedge of protection to be removed, an enemy strike. It's limited. It's contained. It's just a warning. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a grace period. And 9-11, remember, everybody flocked to the churches and said, God yeah. bless America, God bless America. But there was no real repentance. There was no real turning and saying, have we done something? No turning. And the problem is, it was, it was, the response was the same as ancient Israel's. It was a response of defiance. We're going to come back stronger than ever, stronger than ever. So the thing is that the harbin no, when Israel did this, there were nine harbingers of judgment or omens, as you said, that are warning Israel, that appear. And those same nine harbingers of judgment have now reappeared, are reappearing in America on American soil with precision, um, it involves American leaders. Uh, some are in New York, some happen in uh, Washington. Objects, reenactments, almost ceremonies, um, and happen exact, it's exact, well, precise reenactments. It's chilling when you, yeah. you know, the whole thought. I, mean, I noticed you played a big thing about, you know, we will rebuild. That's what the Jews yeah. said, the yeah. Israelis. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the parallel here in our country? Well, it's, exactly, it's exactly what America did. Uh, in, in, in view of 9-11, it wasn't, again, repentance. It was, we're going to come back stronger than ever, stronger than ever. Leaders start chanting the same words as in ancient Israel. And they said, we're going to rebuild, you know, the Isaiah 9 says, we're going to rebuild, we're going to rebuild stronger than before. We're going to come back and we're going to keep going away from God, but we're going to be stronger. That's exactly what happens. They set to rebuild, as, as Israel did, just as it was, we're going to rebuild the towers, we're going to, but stronger than ever, you know, with no repentance. That's the problem, not the rebuilding. Mm -hmm. um, and, we're, and everything that, that happened in ancient Israel, specifically, I mean, there's a, there's a tree involved in this, there's a stone involved in this, um, everything they did that was repeated by America. Um, it start, for instance, uh, it said they, there is a stone, one of the harbingers is a stone yeah. called the Gazit stone, a stone of judgment. And they take a quarried stone and they, and they have to put it, they put it on where the bricks had fallen. And they, it says, we will rebuild with quarried stone. And there they vow, and it's a stone representing defiance. It has to happen in America. In America, after 9-11, they take a stone, the same thing that answers to the Hebrew Gazit stone. They take it, they put it down on ground zero. They have a ceremony around it. The American leaders are gathered and they pronounce vows over that stone. Uh, another harbinger is that of the tree. It's called the shakam tree in, in Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, the sycamores have fallen. So a tree has to be struck down by, by the events of 9-11 according for this to happen. That's what happened in Israel. So what happens is freak event. When, as the last tower comes down, it sends out a beam, it sends out a force, and it strikes down an object that happened to be nearby. It's a tree. It's the, biblical, it's the sycamore. It has the same exact name as that in well, Isaiah. You mean in America we had a sycamore tree that was struck by 9-11? Yes. And, and, and in New York, what are the chances of that. In New York, right there, the same thing. Everything, every single thing that's in there, these nine harbingers, have happened with exact precision. Where was that tree? Now, your book makes it so amazing, that tree. The tree was at the corner of Ground Zero. It was at the courtyard of St. Paul's Chapel, where there's a whole other mystery, you know, be, with that, with the founding of America. Yeah, it was right there. And then, the, and then the, the other harbingers, they have to replace this tree with another particular tree. That's, ex that's what happened in Isaiah 9. That's exactly what they do. They lower another tree. It's the exact 
exact, exact kind of the Bible that what's said in there. Come on, it was sycamore tree. It was the, the sycamore tree was struck down as a sign of national judgment. Okay, and, and then it's and replaced put, with, with, with with what's called in Hebrew the Erez tree, a certain yeah. kind of tree. They th that's in Isaiah nine ten. That's exactly what happened. They replaced it with the same tree in the same soil. They have a ceremony around it. They pronounce it, it's a it's a defiant thing. Same thing. And, and then there's the vows itself. One, one of the, the harbingers is that, that the leaders of Israel had to say this vow. We will rebuild with quar all this, this thing. It has to happen. So, so for this to come true, it has to happen in America. American leaders have to be able to say this vow, proclaim this vow, which, which really seals judgment on the nation, um, and, and do it in the capital city, which they would have done in Samaria. Right. So, but the thing is that wh who in their right mind, what leader would in their right mind do this? Because it's pronouncing judgment on the nation. It happens on the very day after 9-11. On, on September 12th, America gives its response to God. It's not repentance. What happens is the Congress gathers, and on Capitol Hill, the Senate Majority Leader comes to the stand, and he says, and he pronounces the, he, pronou he actually voices the exact vow of Isaiah 9:10, the ancient vow of America's leader. He he had, he does this, which is he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, nobody right. can have any idea, and it is pronouncing judgment on the nation. It's linking America to ancient Israel. We will. That was Dashiell. That, that was, was Tom Dashiell. Tom Dashiell. The, the day after. The day after, in the exact verse, it's to the world. I mean, he couldn't be more precise. It's linking, he, but he doesn't realize what he's doing. It's, it, is, it is setting the course, and it's even prophetic, because he's saying things that is going to happen. He says, this is going to be the course of America. We're going to follow Isaiah 9:10. He says that, in effect, that's exactly what happened. For the, the next years, we, we sought to defy it and, and, and beat it back. But the problem is, without repentance, you cannot, well, you cannot solve the problem. They even linked to 9 I mean, to, to Isaiah 9, didn't it? Was, was it uh, yeah. Biden? Who said? Who oh. said? Did Dashiell quote? D Dashiell quoted it exactly. He says, he says, I believe there's a, lore, there's a word, and it's from Isaiah, that speaks to all of us at times like this. And then he says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The, the sycamore, the, fig, the, the biblical fig tree, has been struck down, but we will plant cedars in their place. He doesn't realize, as he says that, what it means. And he doesn't realize that there is an actual sycamore tree that was struck down. Yeah. He doesn't realize that, that prophetically, years later, they're going to put the same thing. He's pro it's like he's prophesying without realizing. Oh, that, that sycamore, you, you pointed that, that after they had signed the uh, Constitution, they marched across to that church. Well, the, 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 there's, there's a, yeah, there's a biblical principle that, that, that with Israel, judgment came to the Temple Mount. That's where the nation was consecrated to God, dedicated to God. So judgment returns to the consecration ground. So in American history, the, the first day of America as a, as a fully formed nation was, uh, was April 30th, 1789, with Washington's inauguration. Right. And they, you, as I said, they go over, and, they, and then after the inauguration, he leads them to go over and to, to dedicate the future of America at this ground. So that's the consecration ground. So where was it? The first capital of America wasn't Washington. It was New, New York, York City, right. lower Manhattan. So where did they go? They went to dedicate America, commit the future into God's hands, in what is now Ground Zero, the corner of Ground Zero, St. Paul's Chapel. It still stands. They dedicated America. The judgment returns to the place of consecration. And with Israel, and, and that's, the, that's the soil where the sycamore was growing. That's the soil, America's consecration ground, where the other tree was planted and where these harbingers appear. And so it's a warning. With, with, with God, he was calling Amer uh, Israel back, saying, he's saying, remember your consecration. Return to me. Return to this ground. It all happened. It all happened. And on 9-11, there was only one place that was protected or on the perimeter of 9-11. All the buildings were, were destroyed or charred. Or one, one was protected. It was the ground where America was prayed for, the consecration at St. Paul's Chapel. And on that day, a shock wave went forth from ground zero, the place of consecration, yes. and it struck Federal Hall, the place where Washington was sworn in. That's where the government began, and it cracked the foundation on that day of America's foundation. And also on that day, Washington gave a prophetic warning. What and, he, said? And he said, and I'm paraphrasing, no. but he says, basically, if America ever turns away from God, if a nation turns away from God's ways, God's rules, the favor, the smiles of heaven, or the favor of God are going to be with, removed from the land. He does it on that day, goes to where ground zero is, and then so now it is there where the favor or the protection was lifted up. Yeah. But the Federal Hall was cracked. The foundation yes, was cracked. Yes, on 9/11, on from a shockwave from Ground Zero, you have the place of dedication, and you have the place of the beginning of America's. But nation. they have rebuilt. I mean, they planted yeah. a tree, a new tree. I mean, they rebuilt. I mean, they put 
they put yeah. in a dress stone and then the, the, what everything kind of, what kind of tree do they put in they put a hebrew erez tree which is which is a cedar tree it's a panache it has to be a panache tree that's the most exact definition of the hebrew cedar and so they put in a tree and nobody planned it someone just donated it say okay put this tree in and so instead of doing another sycamore they do the exact tree so they they plant it and they have a ceremony they call it the tree of hope they make all these things into symbols without realizing it it's the exact tree in the bible it's the exact hebrew definition Panesh? of that tree is Ere, erez tree it's which is is a panache tree. It can be a cedar, but okay. it's also an evergreen conifer. Panache tree is the exact tree, and nobody plans it. It just happens. It just happens. And then it, it goes on because the harbingers, and we, we, you know, we're just touching on them, but there's more. But it goes on to affect everything the economy, the crash of Wall Street. There's, there's a mystery uh, in American history that the beginning of America's rise to superpower, financial rise, there's a, there's a sign that appears at the beginning. It reappears on 9 11. It is all, the, it is the, we get the word, you know, Wall Street is called buttonwood, you know, yeah. uh, you know yeah. because, it, because it was, the covenant was signed under a buttonwood, buttonwood tree. tree yeah. And so what is the buttonwood tree? It's the sick more tree. It's the sign of American wow. power. On 9-11, that tree is struck down, even, even a foreshadow of the striking down of America's economy, which happens years later. The tower strikes that down. There's another um, mi a mystery in it of three witnesses, that in the Bible, there have to be two or three witnesses to right. confirm a fact or a matter of judgment. So you had, we mentioned um, Tom Daschle. He, right. he, he's the first witness. He, he links America to, to ancient Israel. He pronounces it. That's not the only one. Three years later, on, on the anniversary of 9-11, another national leader come, is in Washington. He gets to, the, to the, his, his, his podium, and he, he says the speech, his speech, his entire speech, he says, we have a word here now, and he starts reciting the ancient vow of judgment, the same verse of Isaiah, and he builds his whole speech around it. It is John Edwards. Yeah. And he, the whole speech is built around, and he has no idea still that it's actually happening. The sycamore, he's saying we're going to do this, so he's speaking figuratively, he has no idea. And then the third witness is the President of the United States, and that is Barack Obama. And this is, at, this is not even 9-11. This is right. after 9-11. The economic collapse happens, and he gets up to, to tell the nation, hey, we're going to come back. And he, he makes the center of his speech. He says, I want every American to know these words, basically. This, we will rebuild. We will recover. He actually says the exact words that, that, uh, that Tom Daschle said from the pulpit. The third one, in the same place, Capitol Hill. One said it on one wing of Congress. Yeah. The other says it on the other wing of Congress. Everything. So the economic, even the economic collapse, even the very day of it, even the very days were ordained in an ancient mystery in the, in, in the Bible. It's, it's amazing. The, the, the crash of Wall Street. You know, we also, this. there's a mystery in the Bible called the Shemitah or the seven-year mystery. Every seven years, Israel mm -hmm. would rest. You know, and, and uh, on the last day of that year, they would they would wipe out their credit and debt. It would happen on the, on, on the specific Hebrew day, the 29th of Elul. And so it became, it was supposed to be, all, the, the nation's financial accounts are wiped out. And this is a blessing, but they turned it into a judgment. They turned away from God, so it came back as a sign of judgment. So the Shemitah, or the, or the seven sab, the sabbatical year, it becomes a sign of judgment against a nation that has driven God out of its life, that has put money above him, and that it strikes the financial uh, realm of it. So when did the the financial collapse happened. It happened seven years after the first shaking comes the second shaking. Seven years after 9-11, September of 2008, seven years to the month, the second week of September, seven, seven years to the week um, when America's commemorating 9-11. It actually, actually the, the second calamity is set in motion. And when did the greatest day of the collapse happen? It happened at the end of September, greatest stock market crash in American history, right. point crash. When did it happen? It happened on the 29th day of Elul, the day of the Shemitah, the day of the judgment on a nation's financial realm that has driven God out. And one other thing, I know there's so much, is that if you go back seven years, not only do you find 9-11, you find you know, but you find the other greatest crash in American history up to that point. It happens, and when did that take place? It happened on the exact same Hebrew day, the 29th day of Elul, the, the day of the judgment of a nation's financial realm that has turned away from God, driven him out. And it's mind-boggling, mind-boggling. And, and there's so much, but, but the call is God is calling America back. How soon do you think the final blow will come? If, is there a timing in the Hebrew that you found? Well, the, the, with, with Israel, with ancient Israel, it was 10 years, which we're around, that we're there now. 10 years. With Judah, it's the same pattern. There was an initial strike, then there was a, a total collapse. 
Um, it was 20 years. So we can't say exactly. There's no one. There's a pattern. But with America at the point, the thing is that we are now in this period of hanging in the balance. And it's certainly if we, we say after 9-11, have we returned to God? No. no. It's returned more away from God. And so God is calling America to return. God is calling his people to return. It's that's not true. just you said it earlier. And that's the word I had. He's calling, he's calling America, the people of God, we have to pray. We have, if my people who are called by my name shall yeah. humble themselves and pray. He is calling each of us to, to, to come consecrate ourselves, to pray for America, and to, the time is late, and to turn away from whatever we have to turn away from and get back to him, be light, spread the word. Well, question. You know, it's an amazing thing that uh, George Bush as president said the way to deal with this matter is to go out and everybody shop and spend money, you yes. remember? Exactly. Shop. Exactly. Spend money. Exactly. Yeah. And the, and the thing is, yeah, and that's exactly an end. I mean, we couldn't even go into it, but, but it was actually the Federal Reserve that took actions right then. They took an action on, on the day of that first collapse after 9-11. And the action they took, the, there's an Isaiah 9-10 effect in the book saying that as the nation seeks to come back without repenting, uh, it's going to actually bring about the next shaking, the next mm. collapse. Exactly what happened. As America said, we're going to cut the interest rates. Well, that actually produced this house of cards it actually, 9-11 actually produced, actually brought about the economic collapse. It's amazing. How did God get this? this just, was this sort of a revelation? I mean, did the, the Holy Spirit... It just, it, just, it just happened. It was like one step after the other. I didn't know where it was going. It just kept leading and leading to the next step until it just opened up and exploded. Well, Jonathan, I tell you, this is one great book. Ladies and gentlemen, you want to get this. Can we get this book? I mean, is it available now? It's, uh, I think the official release, I think it happens to be today. Today and it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't planned. It happens to be today. And I think it's available everywhere, Amazon, everywhere. Well, you um, don't want to the Harbinger folks. This is a read you need to make. And uh, maybe our leaders will read it. So the answer is national repentance. We've got to come back to God. Absolutely. As a nation and the people of God, we are, we are kind of, there are people who are saying, let's just, they're just, just handing it out to everybody. And just to get the word out, we, we must return. We must return. Yeah. And we're in the days of danger. Well, yes, a prophetic word. Thank you so Thank much. You God bless you. Thank you. We'll be back with a few questions after this. What an amazing guest and what an amazing story. The Harbinger, folks. Time for Publishers Clearinghouse to make another dream come true. You're a Publishers Clearinghouse winner, Mrs. Jones. Jones, they live next door. Let's go, guys. No! Okay, that wasn't real, but this is, and you could be next. Watch for the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, or go to pch.com and enter. February 29th, you could win one million dollars every year for life, for real. If you're tired of stabbing your fingertips to test your blood glucose, we have news that could change your life. The Embrace Meter from Diabetes Care Club is nearly painless. And the best news is that Diabetes Care Club would love to send you one of these meters. Call now to find out why. Nearly a quarter of a million patients have joined Diabetes Care Club. Membership is free. So is the call. Call 1-800-935-3114. Talk to Diabetes Care Club. You'll be glad you did. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. Well, we have 30 seconds left. I'm going to give you our first chat room question. Do you have any New Year's resolutions? That comes uh, from Paul. I don't make resolutions because I never keep them. But what <laughs> I... Uh, what I Your have, honesty is refreshing. <laughs> I've been in prayer and I ask God for three things. I say, God, I want wisdom. I want the anointing and I want favor. And I said, God, I just ask for these things and I ask them over and over again. And that's for me, it's not a resolution, it's a prayer. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Here at CBN, we see incredible things happen when we stand together. 
That's why we want to thank the thousands of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club. Your monthly gift makes it possible to bring crucial help to people who need it most. Each day you have a part in healing the sick, feeding the hungry, and broadcasting the gospel across America and around the world. You've brought hope and help to those in desperate need and changed their lives forever. Just like you did for Yanan, no matter how hard her parents tried, they couldn't raise the money for the life-saving operation she needed. That's when you provided the heart surgery that saved Yanan's life. You ended her pain and her parents' despair, giving them all a bright future. So please watch for this mailing and send in your pledge. This year, millions will experience the love and saving power of Jesus Christ only because you were there.